Welcome to DYW Newscape with me, your host, Aiden, and I'm more than delighted to say that we have got the legend of Eddie the Eagle with us. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Very good. And are you glad to be here? <laughs> of course, yes. It's always nice to uh, do what I can to help uh, people with, uh, with different events and things. So, uh, yeah, lovely to be here. Well, thank you ever so much for giving your time up to support DYW and help me show the young people how we can get into your profession and how you can cope throughout lockdown. So how would young people know you and what is your profession? Uh, well, I was a ski jumper. I'm not a ski jumper anymore, although I do a little bit of ski jumping, but not very much now. Uh, but people might know me from the film, uh, the movie Eddie the Eagle, that was released about four and a half, five years ago. So if you weren't born, because I went to the Olympics 33 years ago, so mm -hmm. kids wouldn't have been born anywhere near there. Mm -hmm. So the film hopefully would have brought my, fil uh, my, my life story up to date so younger people might know me from that. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else will know me from anything else. Or so maybe Splash, if you're old enough. I did Splash about six, seven years ago. Oh, wow. And how did it come across you being asked to have a film of your life? Um, well, I signed the deal to make this movie 21 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. The Olympics in Calgary were 33 years ago, and I had no idea that they were ever going to make a film about my life, about my journey to Calgary. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they made cool runnings about the Jamaican bobsled team, I thought, well, I'll never make another movie about the same Olympics. But then I was approached about 21 years ago to make a film and the, the project just kept stalling. And after five or 10 years, I thought the film will never be made. Mm -hmm. And then I did a TV show called Splash with Tom Daly. Um, yes. They were teaching celebrities to springboard dive. And I won the first series. And oh. Dexter Fletcher, the film director, he saw me perform in Splash and thought there must be a story there. And then he'd heard that I signed these movie rights some 15 years beforehand. And so they bought the rights and they started making the film. And that's how it came about. So how did they decide who was going to play you then? Did you have an input in that? Uh, I wish I did, but no, I didn't. Uh, because 21, 22 years ago, they were looking at a guy called Robbie Williams from Take That. Yes. He was going to give up singing and become an actor. That fell through. <laughs> They were looking at Simon Pegg, but that fell through. Yes. Rupert Grint, the red-headed guy from the yes. Harry Potter films, I thought he would have been good, but that fell through. Ewan McGregor, but that fell through. So all these different people, they were getting to try and play me, but um, mm -hmm. nothing worked. But I'm so glad that they got Taron um, because I couldn't believe how much he looked like I looked 33 years ago. Mm -hmm. He had the jaw, the moustache, the glasses, the hair, and he sounded and acted just like me. So... Um, they did a really, really good job uh, in getting him to play me in the film. So how did you get into your sector of work then? Uh, school. It all started at school, mm -hmm. on a school ski trip. Um, I used to watch Ski Sunday religiously mm -hmm. during the winter. But then when I went to uh, senior school, um, I was asked if I wanted to go on a ski trip and jumped at the chance. And it all started from there. And also, I come from Cheltenham in Gloucestershire, and we have a big dry ski slope in Gloucester. Mm -hmm which was 10 miles away, Gloucester Ski Centre. It's one of the biggest in the UK. Mm -hmm. So that became that became my home. I was up there every night after school, all weekend, all school holidays. So if I wasn't at school, I'd be over at Gloucester Ski Centre skiing away. Got into racing, alpine ski racing, went up through the ranks and started racing internationally and then went to America to race, ran out of money and the jumps were cheaper. So I studied ski jumping. And that's what? how it went. That's how it went. Wow. What inspired you to go into ski jumping rather than say just normal skiing or any other sport that's in the winter olympics uh well i did do a few winter olympic sports uh skiing mainly slalom yes. giant slalom super g and i got into downhill i did a bit of speed skiing and mm -hmm. a little bit of aerials as well but um i was in america saw the ski jumps and it was much cheaper so it's an economic decision um Ski jumping cost me five dollars a day, whereas to go racing, alpine ski racing, it was costing me nearly two hundred dollars a day. So oh, okay. I thought, well, I can still stay there and do ski jumping, but I couldn't stay there and do my racing because it was just too expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, I switched sports and started just like the film. I started on the very, very small jumps and then I worked my way up to the big jumps. And, uh, and that's how I did it. How old were you when you realized that? you wanted to do this and when you first experienced something to do with ski jumping? 
Uh, I was quite late. I started ski jumping when I was 22, uh, mm -hmm. where that's when most people are giving up ski jumping mm -hmm. because you really have to start ski jumping when you're very young, four, mm -hmm. five, six years old, mm -hmm. um, because then you don't know what fear is. So uh, it's more easier to do it. But mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was 22, I knew what fear was. And so it was very, very difficult. Uh, but I managed to, uh, you know, break all records. Uh, a lot of the trainers that I was training with said I wouldn't go more than a 50 meter ski jump. But I got up to the 120 and they said, you'll never jump more than about 50 meters. And I ended up jumping 120 meters. So, um, you know, despite it was scary and it still is scary, mm -hmm. I still managed to, you know, do quite good things. Did you have any jobs before you were a ski jumper? And if so, how did you make the transition? Um, gosh, I've had lots and lots of jobs. Um, the best job I had was a plasterer because my dad was a plasterer. My granddad was a plasterer. Mm -hmm. My brother is a plasterer. And all my uncles work in the construction and plastering industry. So it was natural for me to go into plastering. And it was very good because back then I could work with my dad for a month save up as much money as I could because he would pay me cash and then I would mm -hmm. borrow my mum's car and then drive into Europe and then I would make that money go as far as I possibly could I would sleep in the car I would scrape food out of bins mm -hmm. and that kind of thing so I made the money last as long as possible mm -hmm. um, so I did that that was really good plastering um, but then when I was out in Europe I would get jobs while I was out there I used to um, in the summer I would cut grass um, or, you know, fix things for mm -hmm. hotels or houses in, in exchange for a bit of money or food and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I did lots of handiwork, cutting grass, waiting tables, washing up, scrubbing floors, all that kind of thing. So, uh, so how did you transition from those jobs into ski jumping? Well, the jobs themselves paid for the ski jumping. They okay. made me able to stay out there and do my ski jumping. Mm -hmm. um, so and then when I wasn't working, I was doing all my training, you know, going running and uh, things like that. And then when the jumps were open, I'd go to the ski jumps and I would jump mm -hmm. because we don't have a ski jump in the UK. It's very, very difficult. I have to go into Europe all the time mm -hmm. to ski jump. So and then when I ran out of money, I would come back to the UK for a month or so work with my dad in the construction industry and plastering, save up some money again and, and go back. So I was just mm -hmm. toing and throwing, depending on how much money I had and uh, how long it would last me. And I would be out in Europe for, for sometimes two months, three months or four months, and I would come home and do some more work. But it was always plastering and building because I, I could make the most money in the shortest time. So where would you suggest young people go to ski jump if they wish to try this out? Uh, that's very difficult because, uh, you know, all the, the, the nearest ski jump is Courcheval in France, and that's still mm -hmm. seven, eight hundred miles away. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very difficult if you want to start ski jumping. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. there, there is a good there is a good ski jump center in Courcheval in France. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's lots of ski jumps in Europe, uh, yes. in France, you know, Italy, Austria, Germany, and they've got small jumps mm -hmm. as well. So you can practice um and look on the internet and, uh, and and see where they are but there are lots of around yes. there's some in scandinavia as well finland sweden norway and of course you don't have language barriers up there because everybody speaks english so uh, it's easier to do it up there whereas in france and germany it can be a little bit more difficult um and then start on the very very small jumps and, and then work your way up and see how it goes that's the what best was way your to do it. what was your favorite jump then uh, well, the first jump I jumped on was a 10 meter ski jump, and then I moved up to the 15 meter and then the 20 meter. And then I went mm -hmm. uh, 20, 40, 60, 90, 120. Mm -hmm. But I did it in five months instead of seven years. And where did you do that then? All over uh, in, in Lake Placid in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. I did the 10, the 15 and the 40. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Switzerland, a place called Kandersteg in the mm -hmm. middle of Switzerland, a tiny little village. Um, they had a 60 meter there and a 90 meter. And then the first 120 meter I did was in Germany. So, uh, so I did a lot of traveling and people used to tell me, you know, where the jumps were. So if I was jumping in Kandersteg, I met other jumpers and they mm -hmm. said, oh, we jump in such and such a place. So they gave me the address and off I would drive. And of course, we didn't have sat -nads back then. So, um, you know, I just had to get a big map and, and a road map and, and find my way. So now it's easy because you've got sat-navs. 
So how would you say you're so well known today? Would you say it's your film or would you say it's the Olympics? Well, for older people, if you're 40, 40 years old or older, then it would be probably from the Olympic Games mm -hmm. itself in Calgary in 88. But if you're younger, then I'd say the film um, is the, the biggest um, way of knowing who I am or, or people just, uh, you know, people people talk in the skiing industry. So my name you know gets bounded around or doing the odd TV show. Uh, people think, oh, who's he and what's he doing and how is he famous? And then they look it up and things like that. But mm -hmm. it's really the film, I think, that is the biggest thing. OK, so if a young person came up to you and asked you, Eddie the Eagle, how do I get into ski jumping what would you suggest to them um i would say learn to ski first mm -hmm. because you have to ski to be able to ski jump so if you mm -hmm. can't ski go and have a, a lesson at a dry ski slope your nearest dry ski slope or the indoor ski slopes we have around the uk now um mm -hmm. and learn to ski and then go to europe and uh, you know find a ski jump and uh, and see if you can have a go uh, a lot of places do have little clubs you know children's clubs yes. so they teach people from you know five years old onwards all the ski jumps have local uh, children's clubs and uh, and you can learn to ski jump and uh, and go from there but it's expensive especially if you've got to travel all that way it's it's a mm -hmm. lot of money did you watch bradley and barney breaking dad on monday no but somebody said they mentioned me I yes don't know what they, they did were doing. They were, yeah. at, they were at Slovenia down and they both of them were trying to ski jump. So Barney was allowed to ski jump, but because of Bradley's age, they said no. Ah. So we got to see them try out some ski jumping in Slovenia. Yes, Planitza. Yes. Yes, yes, I ski jumped there a few times. Really, really good ski jumps. They've got one of the biggest ski jumps in the world in what? Planitza. What? Yeah, they, I think they, they held the world record for 254 metres, uh, a ski jump. Uh, and uh, yeah, the biggest, Ooh. there's only two hills in the world where you can jump over 250 mm -hmm. metres. And one of them is Planitza uh, in Slovenia and the other one is in um, Norway. With so many sectors closed just now, how would you suggest to young people to keep developing their skills so they don't lose them? Um, well, just do whatever you can. Um, physical training helps being as fit as possible. So um, if you can carry on your, your training, like your running, your cycling, going to the gym, doing stretching, flexibility work, that kind of thing. And visualization works as well. Because when I was home from the, from the ski jumps back in the UK doing some plastering, if I sat and closed my eyes and imagined myself on the ski jump, walking up, putting my ski jumping skis on, sliding out onto the bar, coming down the jump, hitting the takeoff and flying through the air and see and feel everything that I would see and feel. It's <coughs> like actually being there. So if I haven't ski jumped for a month, as long as I keep visualizing myself ski jumping, when I go back to ski jumping, it's like I've never been away because I've constantly gone through it in my mind. And that's an excellent way to do it. Whatever sport you do, that's the, the best way. And how many hours does it take you to ski jump then? How many um, hours to build the skills and then go on the ski jump and then jump oh it, it 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 varies from person to person it depends on how fit you are as well what shape you are how whether you're tall or short um, bigger or smaller um all that kind of thing and mm -hmm. how fit you are and also mentally how strong you are because you know it's it's a difficult sport to do mm -hmm. it's a scary sport it's a dangerous sport yes. um, although not so dangerous nowadays uh, the, the the sport is a lot safer than it used to be um so uh, yeah i would spend you know if i was out there ski jumping i would be jumping all day all morning all afternoon and sometimes all evening because some ski jumps have floodlights so you can jump at night so um yeah whatever jump was open i'd be there jumping away and, and i would put up to you know 16 18 hours a day some days was there many injuries coming out of the 16 18 hours of practice um not always no i have injured myself quite a few times but not uh, i did forty thousand jumps and i injured myself about eight times so it's only one injury every five thousand jumps so that was quite good i fractured my skull twice i broke my jaw smashed my collarbone Ooh. broke three ribs damaged mm -hmm. my kidney and damaged my knee so um but uh, not not too bad really considering the amount of jumps that i did so. mm -hmm. 
And are you working on any new projects just now that you are allowed to see? Uh, no, nothing at the moment. I'm, I'm at home. I'm renovating the house. Uh, so I'm still in the construction mm -hmm. industry. So whenever I'm not doing talks or TV or mm -hmm. things like that, then I'm at home working on the house and I'm clearing the garden. I've got permission to build two mm -hmm. new houses in my garden. So mm -hmm. I might start that. Um, and then uh, just waiting for things to open up again. Uh, and then I'll be busy doing my talks. I still travel around the world, mm -hmm. speaking at dinners and conferences. I do the old TV show here and there. So, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing major at the moment until things start to relax after this COVID situation. Yes. And then, um, you know, things will open up again. Apart from your film, what would you say, apart from your film and the Olympics, what would you say is a great achievement from you? Um, whew. Having, uh, getting, ma getting married and having two children mm -hmm. has been very, very, very good. Um, I've really loved the fact that I've been very, very flexible because, um, you know, I work in plastering, which I can stop at any time if I want to go off and do something else. It gives me something to fall back on so I can do, I can try different things. And if they don't work, I can still go back to my plastering. So it's something there that I've always got. It. So it's like my comfort, yes. um, you know, my, my safety blanket. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, nothing. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, having kids uh, and uh, just enjoying, uh, enjoying my life, really. It's been great fun. Uh, I still like building houses. I still like being mm -hmm. in construction. Still love my plastering. Um, I still, oh, I do dancing now, so I, I dance a lot. I probably dance more than I ski. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's good fun. Uh, I just uh, like doing different things. This new segment on DIY Newscape, I'm calling Your Soul. they are questions inspired from the brand new film that was released on Disney Plus on Christmas Day called Soul, and they aim to help you and your family cope through lockdown. So, Eddie the Eagle, could you please tell us what are the simplest things that make you happy just now? The simplest things, gosh, getting up in the morning makes me yes. happy. The fact that I've woken up uh, uh, makes me happy. Um, and I always do things that I enjoy doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I enjoy keeping fit. Uh, I enjoy going for a run and going cycling because the fitter I am, the more I'm able to do. Uh, it makes it easier for me to do my plastering. It makes it easier for, for me to do my dancing or do my skiing. So keeping fit is really good and not only good for the body it's good for the mind too mm -hmm. when i when i go walking for an hour i feel really good i've got a buzz I, I listen to my radio when i'm walking or listen to music um i really really enjoy mm -hmm. it so uh, that that really makes me happy and you know being active mm -hmm. with work and with, uh, with with sport and training and things like that it keeps me mentally active as well and so that's uh, that's the best thing you can do is there any music that you're listening to tonight that you recommend to the viewers? Oh, I'm I'm very much middle of the road. I like things like Ed Sheeran. Uh, I like uh, oh gosh, uh, you put me on the spot now. Uh, just mm -hmm. very much middle of the road. I listen to the top forty. Uh, I'm not into rap music so much, uh, but uh, just definitely middle of the road kind of stuff. I, I can't even think what I've got on my iPod at the moment. Uh, but I, I do like Ed Sheeran. I like Louis Capaldi as well. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got some great songs out. Uh, so yeah, just middle of the road stuff. And is there any things you <coughs> is there anything you are loving just now, like a project or something you do with your family? Um, no, I've not actually seen my family for a little while now because I got divorced about uh, five years ago. But my girls live in the next village. Uh, mm -hmm. But because of the lockdown, uh, I've not been able to see them very much because um, they're in a bubble with uh, their grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. So and because they're quite old and quite fragile, um, I tend not to go and see them mm -hmm. that often at the moment. But um, so I'm looking forward to seeing them again mm -hmm. soon if, if things start to relax a little bit more. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that keeps me uh, keeps me going. The fact that I, I, I still speak to them, you know, on FaceTime and yes. I, I message them a lot and that kind of thing. So um, but I have a nice routine as well. You know, I, I get up, I go to to Greg's, have a cup of coffee. I come back and do some work in the garden or in the house. Um, I go running. I get on my bike. Sometimes I'll cycle to, you know, cycle 40 or 50 miles on my bike listening to my radio and come home. So I do lots of things that keep me, uh, you know, keep me active and keep my brain going and keep me happy. 
It seems like you love Greg, so can you tell the viewers what's your <laughs> favourite item on the Greg's menu? Well, in the morning I have a, they, they do a, a sausage or a bacon in a bap with brown or brown sauce or ketchup and a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. So I go there for breakfast. I do love their vegan sausage rolls. Mm -hmm. They're really, really nice. I can't tell them apart from their regular sausage rolls. <laughs> um, but I also like the, uh, the cheese and onion um, uh, uh, pasties. I like the bean cheese mm -hmm. and sausage uh, pasty. Uh, I like the steak bake. I like the chicken pasty as well. There's not, there's nothing that I don't like mm -hmm. uh, at Greg's, and I like their cakes too. So, uh, but their coffee is good. I like their yes. coffee. I go there almost every day, at least once a day, for a cup of coffee. Good. So, if someone asked you just now because they need something to do, they would say, "What film?" or TV show should I watch? What would you recommend that they watch? <laughs> oh gosh, that is so hard. It depends on what you're into really. <laughs> what um, are you watching like, just now? Well, I like, uh, I like building shows like Grand Designs because yes. I work in construction. I love watching mm -hmm. you know, new, new ideas, new systems to build houses. So mm -hmm. I do enjoy watching that kind of thing, uh, Grand Designs. I love things like First Dates, uh, I like uh, Undatables. That's a good show. Yes. Um, I still like the soaps. I like Corrie, Coronation Street. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I've been watching a couple of things. Uh, what was the one I was watching last night? Uh, that was based up in Dundee. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was really good. I've, I've watched a couple of the show's yes. uh, dramas. Yes. Um, with uh, uh, um, people on that. So I, I've watched that. Um, yeah, I, I, it's not that much that I actually enjoy, but I love catch up TV because then I can work to my schedule. I don't <laughs> often turn the television on until about 10 o'clock at night. Traces. That's it. Traces, yes. That's it. Yep. So uh, so I like that. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, uh, yeah, just, and, and then I'll go on to film four and watch whatever films are around. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, um, it, but I use, I use television to relax. So I'll put the TV on about 10 o'clock at night, start to relax, and then come midnight, I'm ready to go to bed and go to sleep. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I only use it as a way to kind of relax, really. So is it a film that you'd recommend? <gasps> well, Eddie the Eagle is a good one. Yes, <laughs> it is. But maybe, <laughs> but maybe I'm a bit biased. Um, yes. Gosh. Um, I can't think. Oh, I love the Shawshank Redemption. That's a really, Ooh, really good film. Yes. Really good film. Um, I did like that one. Um, I like uh, comedies like Meet the Fockers. Um, oh, yes. That's, 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 a that's really film. good. I like the Bourne films, the Bourne mm -hmm. Ultimatum, the Bourne Supremacy, all those mm -hmm. films. I love the James Bond films, especially the new ones with um, Daniel yes. Craig. Love all those. Um, I do like action adventure type things. I'm not into sci-fi very much, so no. I'm not into really. I'm not into Star Wars or, you know, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, chick flicks even. I quite like chick flicks. So uh, yeah, anything that I, I think, oh, that looks, seems like a good film, I'll watch it mm -hmm. uh, and see what happens. But uh, I'm not on Netflix, so I don't tend to watch very much. So who inspires you to do ski jumping then? Uh, well, there was a guy called Matty Nukunen. Uh, he was a, an amazing ski jumper. He dominated the sport for 30 years. Uh, he died last year. Um, so unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But he was an amazing ski jumper. Uh, he won the gold medal at Calgary. So uh, he was one. And then when I started skiing, it was people like Franz Klammer, uh, play, people like Harty Weirreiter, Peter Wernsberger, Ingemar Stenmark from Sweden, great mm -hmm. skier. Back in the in the eighties, um, they were the ones that inspired me when I was a kid. And how how would you or others describe the legend of Eddie the Eagle? <laughs> um, I was a trier. I because um, mm -hmm. I, I came from a country with no snow, no no ski jumps, no training yes. facilities, no money, no equipment, and yet I still went out there and gave it a go, and I managed to achieve my dream of getting to the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. and, with buckets of tenacity and resilience and never giving up, I managed to achieve my dream. So um, I, I'm hoping that people will, will see me and think, well, you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it. So how did we 
the nation come across the name of Eddie the Eagle? How did you come up with the name Eddie the Eagle? I didn't. Uh, it was given to me at Calgary by a group of supporters from an oil company. They saw on Canadian television this news item about Eddie Edwards, Britain's first ski jumper mm -hmm. coming to Calgary, and they gave me the nickname Eddie the Eagle. So when I arrived in Calgary for the mm -hmm. Olympic Games, there was a great big banner on the wall in the airport saying, welcome to Calgary, Eddie the Eagle, and it just exploded and it took mm -hmm. everybody's imagination and that was it. So I didn't, uh, I didn't come up with a name myself. So what would you consider to be your greatest achievement then? Uh, well, getting to the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. the World Championships in 1987, that was great as well. Um, so sporting wise, yes, mm -hmm. definitely Calgary and, uh, and, and the ski jumping. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like then? Ah, oh, wonderful. It was a dream come true. It's been a dream since I was about eight years old to go to the Olympic Games and uh, I made my dream come true. And so, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was fantastic. So are you still in touch with some people that you met at the Olympic Games many years ago? Uh, yes, Facebook is really good for that. Um, yes. So I, I've been with Facebook now for about 20 years. And uh, I've got a lot of my friends who I used to ski jump with <laughs> um, and also the film. When I was going to film premieres in Austria, Germany, France, Italy and in Scandinavia, a lot of the ski jumpers came to watch the film and they loved it. So um, I keep in touch with some of my <laughs> ski jumping friends, my trainers that I used to jump with. Um, all via Facebook, because I don't see them very often. Some of them have moved on and they're coaches now of the national teams. Uh, but I don't go out and train anymore very much anyway, and I don't compete anymore, so mm -hmm. I don't get to see them. But Facebook is really good for things like that, just keeping in touch. Can you suggest a way for young people to cope during lockdown, please? Um, oof, keep busy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the best thing. Keep yeah. busy. Uh, do things. Do anything. Uh, if it, whether it's going out training, you know, go for a run, go for a walk, um, you know, uh, but socially distance, of course. Um, you know, read a book that you've always wanted to read or you've never had time to read. Uh, you know, take up a hobby that you've always wanted to do but never had time to do. Now you've got plenty of time, or at least hopefully you've got plenty of time. You can do things that you probably always wanted to do but mm -hmm. never had the time to do. So, um, yeah, just keep active and keep busy and uh, keep body and mind going. And uh, that's the best way. And that you'll breeze through it. What have you been doing to cope during lockdown then? Um, well, that, that exact same thing. I've been working in my garden. I've got a massive garden, so I'm clearing that at the moment. It's got uh, very overgrown and brambles. I'm renovating the house. I'm building two new houses. Uh, I still go out for a cup of coffee. I go running, cycling, uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. I keep busy, mind and spirit. And I read a lot as well. And determined you you are a determined person if you got to the olympics but how was were you determined to win the splash when you were on that or was it just something you did for fun yes well i, I started doing splash just for fun because i didn't know who was going to be taking part mm -hmm. i didn't know how good they would be mm -hmm. and i thought oh gosh it would be great if i could just make the final that would be excellent that would mm -hmm. be my dream to make the final but i never thought that um, i'd be able to do the dives that i did and not only get to the final, but win the show. So it was a, it was a, it was a bonus. But initially, I was just mm -hmm. doing it for a bit of fun, uh, and uh, you know, see where it goes. I didn't know it was going to lead to having a movie made about my life and that kind of thing. And I've not dived since. Um, but uh, yeah, one of these days, I might go back in and do a bit of bit more diving. So who was the competitors that you were against then when you were on the splash? Um, I did. I think Joey Essex was on it. A model called Caprice was in it. Mm. Um, a gardener, uh, Dermot, um, was on it. Um, oh wow! Gosh, there was a guy from Benidorm, the uh, the barman in Benidorm. He was in it. He cut to the final. Uh, Sue Barker, <laughs> oh, wow. who used to do changing rooms. Oh, she was in Sue, it. Yes, yeah, Sue Barker. Yeah. yeah. So, how was that experience for you then, overall? Oh, loved it. Great fun. I, one of, it's one of the best TV shows I've done. Um, really enjoyed it. I hope they bring it back and uh, they ask me to come back and do it again. But, um, but one of these days I might do Strictly or I might do Dancing on Ice or something like that. I don't know yet. I'll wait and see. Uh, I've been approached to do that SAS programme. Oh, wow. um, 
Yeah. Uh, and but you, hope, you hope to do it? Um, it's well, well, it'd be fun, but uh, I, I have to wait and see because I have to get approached by the production companies to ask if I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, then I have to go for tests to see whether I'm fit enough, psychologically fit enough and um, mentally and uh, physically strong enough to do it. So you've got to go all these tests and things first mm -hmm. and, um, and then they decide whether you're able to do it or not. So do you get approached by these people or can you yeah. go to them and say, I would like to do this? Um, I mean, you can do, but I never do because I'm, I'm always busy doing other things anyway. So uh, I, wait, I tend to wait until they approach me. Um, last year, they, um, Dancing on Ice got in touch with me, but I, I was too busy to do the show. Um, the year before that, I was asked to do Strictly, but I was too busy to do the show. So, um, you know, and, and they come around every few years and ask me if I'd be willing to do it. Um, and then if I'm OK, if I've got time, I'll do it. Well, thank you ever so much for being on this DYW Murray Newscape with your host, Aidan. And I just want to give another big shout out, round of applause, thank you, to Eddie the Eagle for giving his time up to support me and teaching the young people of Murray how to get into ski jumping. You've been watching DYW Newscape with your host, Aidan. And I just want to remind you, hands, face, space, if you are in England, but if you're in Scotland like me, remember facts and we will all be in this together and we will get back to ski jumping if you're into that very very soon thank you ever so much again eddie legal i've been no eddie. that has been eddie thank you thank you ever so much for doing